What's up guys, Heart Pirates TCG here. I am bringing you this video that took a long time to make just because it's really hard to explain what this video is about. And um, it took a while for me to articulate what I was trying to say and make it make sense. And to do that, I had to take it step by step on like breaking everything down so that like you see the cause and effect of, uh, of, of game state, it, it, for example. So uh, before we start the video, again, if you're playing in our tournament, we're, uh, we changed it from December 23rd to December 30th so more people could play. Um, first place wins $1,000. Second through uh, eighth win $200. Of course, if we get more than 80 people, then we will expand the prize, the prize pool to however many we end up getting. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out, the exact numbers, um, you know, as soon as we get the final count. But... To join the tournament, go to our Discord and check out the event details tab. It will have all of the information you will need to join the tournament. It is not too late. Everybody can join from any country, whatever. Just make sure you have a stable connection and some type of audio input and output. Um, yeah, so without further ado, let's go ahead and go to this. So we are going to move my camera once again and... What is pressure? Okay, so like I said, we had to break it down step by step. Pressure is when you force your opponent to play differently than they normally would because they fear the repercussions, the repercussions of making plays they normally would. And, you know, obviously, I, mean, I don't know, pressure in real life is, is different, right? But this is for card games. I don't know if there's an exact definition, but um, I made up my own definition because that's kind of how you have to look at it, right? Is... If your opponent is scared to make plays because you are going to lethal them the next turn or all but lethal them, take them down to zero life, if they're playing red, that's pretty much just lethal because they'll go Diablo, Jumbo, or Luffy, then you are essentially playing with pressure on you, okay? So how do we get there, okay? So this is a process. It's not just one play. So um, if you play Kaido, for example, if... If the guy had, had ne if neither player has taken a life and you drop this Kaido, or let's say the, the person took one life and you drop this Kaido, there's not pressure on the board because yes, the Kaido does swing the momentum in your favor, but like Kaido's real ability to apply pressure comes with you being a low life and him being hard to get rid of. Now, obviously decks like Sakazuki and like, you know, Crocodile can get rid of him relatively easy. Um, or easier than other decks that have to kill him by battle, but his real threat comes at like the very like the towards the middle to end of the game where he swings the game in your favor, and you're worried if you can't take him out on the if you can't remove him from the field effective or efficiently and quickly, then you're going to lose the game because he's going every 10k attack is likely going to connect or warrant you discarding three cards from your hand to get rid of it or a blocker. So that is pressure. But if you drop a nine cost Kaido, like for example, I was playing against somebody who was playing purple Luffy and I was playing Sakazuki and I had, I think I had either had two or three life. And when they played the Kaido, they had absolutely no pressure on the board because I was at a stable life count. And I went ahead and played 10 cost Kaido, the draw four. And like, even if he did two life to me that turn, like purple Luffy has no way of ending the game like in a way that I can't figure like in a way that I can't play around obviously like sheep's horn can do that but obviously you play around that you play like multiple blockers or something like that and obviously you can get rid of this Kaido very easily by either by battle with the 10 cost Kaido or just remove him with like Luchi or something like that right so that's not pressure at all but if you drop him when your opponent has two life half the life that we talked about in this uh, slide right here then that Kaido is going to be not only probably do one life put you at one life because if you're at two life and he comes down he ko's a blocker let's say they can be ko'd something like a, uh something like a hina for example you know the five cost hina or a, you know blocker law and then that you swing into their life for one life well now they're like well damn like one more and <laughs> one more and i'm i'm on last hit um and obviously if they can't get rid of him that turn he's just going to swing freely either at your life or your board and pretty much everything he attacks is either going to warrant a lot of cards from your hand or it's going to warrant you blocking or taking the life, which you don't want to do towards the end of the game because 
Um, oh, we'll talk about that in, uh, right after this. But because your life is a shield. But first, um, let's 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 talk about part two of how we get to pressuring your opponent. So sometimes it is best to play a Magellan. Like let's say you're pay, playing purple Luffy. Sometimes it's best to play a Magellan and attack for seven and a six K then play a seven cost kid. Now, obviously that's not always true. Depends on the situation, but if your opponent obviously doesn't have a lot of counter, let's say you attack for six and they discard two one Ks or something like that the previous turn, then you're like, okay, you have no counter in hand. I can, instead of me almost like bailing you out and only doing one damage, I'm going to attack for two relatively big numbers, six and seven, and you have to either discard you either have to find a 2k from your draw or you're going to be taking two life or discarding a lot of 1k's right and that is something that applies a lot of pressure because your opponent at that point is either is either forced to you know take two life which is huge because most most leaders in this game right now are four four life leaders so you're you're already halfway done in your first like two turns right so that is a huge pressure um that you can put on your opponent however never sacrifice or never in the early game sacrifice dawn for attacks if you can't also play impactful characters now i said sometimes it's better to attack for seven with the page one and 6k with luffy and then play like a magellan but it is not okay to let's say put three dawn on page one and four dawn on luffy and play nothing because building a board state is still very important you have to find a way to do so while also applying pressure and the reason i say that is because you know once that page one is gone now luffy has no other like way of attacking other than kaido on like on their turn because their board's going to be clear if you waste too much dawn applying pressure early and not building a board state, then you're going to lose every time because yeah, the po the opponent you know took two life, but now on the on the on the opposite end of the of the table, they have two cards in hand, and the second they get rid of that page one, either by battle or by card effect, then they are going to be in the clear because everything you play from that point on against most matchups is going to be a slow card. By slow, it means it doesn't do anything uh, crazy on play except for you know cards like yellow like big mom or katakuri or something like that but against like decks like purple there's only one card that has or one card that's relevant that has rush and it's kaido so you know once you clear their board if you spend too much time basically trying to apply pressure with like a page one and an ulti then the second they clear their board the luffy has nothing right they have nothing to play but if you can play impactful characters while also applying pressure something like uh let's say magellan or uh you know, if you have the Dawn for it, Polly, um, or something along those lines, something impactful, or maybe even another page one depends on the situation, then it's sometimes better in certain situations in a vacuum to attack for those bigger numbers rather than play a slower card like seven cost kid. All right. So using your life as a shield. So your life is a resource. A very valuable one it is a shield to allow you to make plays without worrying about lethal damage but with enough six or seven k attacks like we talked about earlier with you know enough of these going into your life you can get your opponent at one or two life very quickly and when your life count is at a low number like that part of every single turn your opponent has to either dedicate some portion of their dawn to playing defensively whether it be blockers or events or clearing your board now some now decks like sakazuki can uh can can clear your board so most of their dawn usually goes to that however you still have a leader swing every single turn if they clear your board you can still swing with your leader eventually if they're at low enough dawn or i'm sorry low enough life and low enough cards in hand then it doesn't matter if you clear their board because the leader still can attack every single turn so you still have to dedicate some type of dan or some type of dawn for blockers and when you do that pressure starts to form you guys like how we're kind of going in a line here it's like uh it's almost like a uh, like a scientific process right is this is where pressure starts to form because your opponent is now playing with less than 10 dawn for the rest of the game in theory right let's say obviously you have 10 dawn everyone has 10 dawn max but if you have to dedicate four dawn every turn to playing a borsalino or a rebecca or saving a dawn up for rad beam or two dawn up for rad beam then you're playing with eight dawn you're playing with 80 percent of your dawn and 
in theory, that puts your opponent behind because they are not playing with the most amount of Dawn. Now, to kind of uh, highlight this point, uh, back in set one, everyone used to say Luffy was better than Zoro. And I was like, I don't understand. You know, obviously I was brand new to the game. I was like, I don't understand why Luffy is better than Zoro. Someone please tell me. And someone put it out to me like this, and I didn't believe him at the time, and later as I grew into the game, I realized that they were right, is Luffy was playing with 11 Dawn, and Zoro was playing with 9 Dawn back in set 1, right? Because every, like there was a very limited card pool in set 1, so a lot of the cards that you know players used were Dawn X1 cards, like something like Nico Robin, or some people played like Brook or something like that. Um, something that was, or, uh, or even Luffy, right? The, the Rush Luffy were Dawn X1 or Dawn X2 cards. And when you're playing with extra Dawn with Luffy's effect, then you are ahead of your opponent because you have that 1K extra every single time. Another example is Whitebeard. Whitebeard is a 6K leader. Uh, Red Purple Luffy is a 6K leader. So that means to attack into your opponent's uh, leader with your leader, you are now using 10% of your turn to be able to attack your opponent, right? Um, so that that's that's huge, right? It's it's Dawn. It's it's uh it's just it's it's dawn efficiency it's just having a surplus of dawn that they don't right dawn is also a resource just like life so when you have the ability to make your opponent play with less of them and you with more you're automatically in a winning position does that does that make sense okay um so that yeah that's that so when you get to your opponent to very low life they also you know pressure starts to form but also, this is where your opponent has to start countering with cards they want to play most of the time, right? Because when you start swinging for 7Ks, of course, they can disc discard two Tashigis in the beginning. But with enough of them, they will now have to discard Tashigi and a Borsalino. Or if they're running low on counter, Rebecca and Brand New. You, you are forcing your opponent to start countering with cards that they want to play. And that is putting them in a lose-lose scenario, which we'll talk about right here, is, God, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, guys, this video has been has been great. If you guys like this video, uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel and, and like, um, like the video. But um, yeah, so again, we're going in a line here, is this, we're going back to my first point. You are forcing your opponent to do something that they do not want to do. Countering out with cards they need to play to win puts them in a lose-lose situation. Also, if your opponent has to attack your characters, then they are giving you more time to kill them with more rush characters and speed decks like Whitebeard, Zoro, and Sabo. I know you're like, Sabo, what the hell? There's a video coming up on that very soon, so be on the lookout for that. But, um, <laughs> so, so yes, so let's talk about the slide real quick. So, countering out with cards that they have to play makes them not be able to play those cards, which are normally win conditions. Like we talked about in this slide right here, a lot of times Borsalino is a very valuable blocker. He can't be KO'd for something like Jet Pistol or Jet Pistol, essentially. I mean, I don't know what, what else KOs, right? Uh, Rebecca and Brand New. Rebecca is a huge power play. And if you're constantly swinging into the opponent's life, then you're not going to be able to play the Rebecca for the, for, for the power play that she is. She is now a 1K counter, just like brand new right brand new is a card that helps you dig for your options if you discard it as a 1k counter you are now limiting the amount of times you can search your deck which now makes your deck less consistent which means you probably won't have the cards you'll need to be able to win the game so all of these cards or all of these uh you know in in this straight line these six or seven k attacks they start to really form pressure and when pressure is formed your opponent has to react to it in a certain way that is less than ideal and when they do that they have to either let's say clear your board or you know play with less dawn and when they clear your board against aggressive decks this is why zora was so good because well, actually, let's just move on to this right here. So this is why, so this is why Zoro is so good. It's crazy how like I'm like literally thinking this in my head of like transitioning into this, and I forgot that I made this like perfectly transition into this is why Zoro was so good. Is you because it's like you clear his characters and he has four life and so many cards to kill you, right? And after you give them life, their hand is refreshed with more lethal capabilities. Let's say you survive the onslaught of Magra and Makano and Nami and Buggy and all of this BS, right? Sunny Kun. You let's say you clear their board, you're at two life. The second you start swinging into their board, they are at <laughs> 
they they are they are more than happy to take that life and then that life will probably be one of these rush characters obviously not ace if you're playing in zoro but one of these rush characters that can help end the game it doesn't matter if you've lost board control because their life is so low at that point that they have to play very defensively and they're not going to be able to kill you at the end of the game when they need to because they don't have enough dawn to get past like a rad beam or guard point or multiple of those so like these cards are like really 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 impactful when your opponent's on the back foot but when you play them really early like if you play zoro too early then obviously it's not nearly as impactful because your opponent let's say has board control and um um, or, 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 or a lot of life left, if you play this Zoro or this Luffy too early, then they'll gladly take the life and then swing into it or remove it later on. So that's why Zoro was so scary is because you had all of these cards that, you know, were re re replacing themselves with Dodon and uh, Buggy and Nami. And then the second you get rid of them and all of their advantage, you had these cards to help end the game. So it was just really tough to deal with. And also at this point, obviously this is unrelated, but also at this point when you are at one or two life, blockers become twice as valuable later on in the game when where pressure is applied. And the reason that it is that way is because blockers, a lot, especially like 6K blockers, right? If we're, if we're being real, nothing like, like I, mean, I guess Doflamingo blocker, the, four, the 4K can be an attack or something like that. But this is where these blockers get twice as much value as they normally would because your opponent is playing with less dawn than they normally have let's say they're playing with six because they have to play a card like borsalina or rebecca let's say they're not applying pressure to your life right because you put them in a lose-lose scenario well now these blockers are not only barriers to it to to uh, prevent you from dying but also if you are not worried about dying these blockers are now offensive tools that of course can, at can attack into your life for 7k for one dawn so when you play these blockers right here they are twice as effective because not only are they preventing you from getting lethal and any possibility of you getting lethal but if your opponent does not have any cards that put enough pressure on your life let's say you get out let's say they swing like 8k at life and you easily blast breath out of it or rad beam out of it or love love mellow out of it well then these cards are turning sideways the next turn and they will apply pressure to your life P pressure that you are already trying to get off your life you thought you were safe because you had oh they're just playing blockers these are still attack threats everybody knows this this is why borsalino always turns sideways for the most part because they can't kill it by uh, card effects on your opponent's turn and when they do try to kill it then um I'm sorry, I think I lost my train of thought. But when when they when they do try to kill it, it's like it doesn't matter. Like I already got the attack through and you already try to attack into it because it is a blocker at the end of the day. So not only did I make you either waste a card or take a life with this Borsalino, but now you are swinging into this card as a blocker. So it is blocked multiple times because, you know, you know, obviously it's easier to defend a 6K than it is a, a 5K, which is your leader. Not only has this Bor Borsalino put in a lot of work or, you know, any of these three blockers right here have put in a lot of work by blocking, by not only attacking, but also if you swing into them or try to clear them, they are now taking away resources and attacks from your opponent because they're trying to clear them so they don't die the next turn. Is that, does that start to make sense, guys? Comment if it makes sense down below. But Toward, now we end this video off is at the end of the day you have to understand what every deck wants to do and try to make them as uncomfortable as possible in their attempt to do so so these four decks right here are like the like the poster boys of uh decks that lose to pressure right katakuri everybody knows that decks like uh like like well i mean i guess whitebeard won against it for a different reason but decks like law were able to kill katakuri not just because they had a lot of blockers but because those blockers could turn sideways and you know um you know they had so much pressure you know wide attacks five at life five at life five at life seven at life restand seven at life there's a lot of stuff that they can do to kill this deck and the deck plays a lot of big characters right they play deck cards like uh at least you know obviously you know in set four they played vanillas like uh randolph and they played uh cards like uh Parasparo, the six costs uh, and then you know all they could do was maybe put one dawn on their leader and swing into whatever it was right and then they were too slow to be able to get rid of the pressure same with crocodile now crocodile was a little bit different because you could bottom deck stuff while also the next turn like getting rid of it like with uh the cards that you let's say you play like uh mihawk or something and then now mihawk is an attacking threat crocodile is a little different but decks like 
uh, law still were pretty good into crocodile decks like Zoro because you can get them to a point where like they c- you can you can pressure them to a point where instead of playing Mihawk, the power card of the deck, you're like this Mihawk is completely worthless. Maybe I can get one uh, one if I'm lucky, and that can kind of like carry me throughout the game. But uh, essentially, with crocodile. At that point, playing against a lot of Zoros myself, you were just trying to establish a bunch of pacifistas and hoping that they can like provide enough pressure and stay on the board long enough for you to be able to get through and clear their board and go for game. So, like all of these cards, uh, same with Kaido. If you guys played, uh, if you guys played Kaido in set one, I played Kid towards the very end. I started out playing Blurple Croc, but I switched to Kid. And when I played Kid, the number one way to beat Kaido was just put them at one life because the second that they play their 10 cost Kaido and wipe the board, well, then I'll just put uh, seven Dawn on my leader and attack you for 12, restand them and attack you for 12 again, right? You keep putting them in a, in a scenario where they will lose if they do. They are damned if they do, damned if they don't, right? And with enough of these attacks, you are going to get them to this point, which is why slower decks like Sakazuki, which obviously has more, you know, it's faster than these three decks right here, but it still loses to wide boards, for example, like, um, now obviously... Uh, this, I would say, is probably favored into Starter Deck 10 Law, but Starter Deck 10 Law can potentially out-tempo Sakazuki, depending on, obviously, draws and, like, what the Saki, Sakazuki has, and, of course, if you are able to go wide enough early, then you are forcing Sakazuki to get rid of cards that search them for answers for your deck, like Brand New and, and Rebecca, so, like... You know, decks like Purple Luffy, for example, obviously Sakazuki, I think, is good into Purple Luffy, but with potential pressure and Sakazuki not drawing the right cards, you can force them into a scenario where they're in a lose-lose situation. So, I hope this all made sense. I think this video was awesome. I, I really, really think that this is a really cool way of breaking down what pressure is and how you get there. And I'm just very, I don't know, I'm, I'm very proud of the videos I've been making. Like, you know, obviously, I think, like, the matches are great. Like, you know, recording and commentating over matches, because I, I like that a lot. I like being able to kind of show you guys, like, like my, my thoughts when people are playing games. Um, I like to be able to, you know, obviously watch games, because I'm a big fan of playing the game. Um, but 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 videos like this, I think, are just really fun to to. to not only to make, but to explain, because it's showing you guys a different side, like the underbelly of this game. And a lot of the people that do really well in tournaments, like they might not be able to put it into words when you're when you're just talking to them normally. But I'm sure if you gave them time to kind of like kind of like uh, dissect their thoughts, they would explain that like this is actually a very important factor on like if you are going to be good at this game because this is something you have to understand just like uh just like reading board state i mean this goes hand in hand with reading board state right how much dawn they're going to have uh what they can do with that dawn dawn capabilities what they play text stuff like that this goes hand in hand with that and if you're going to play at the highest levels if you want to win like a serial luffy or a shanks or you know if you want to win nats this is something you have to understand and have to know like the back of your hand so I'm very happy that I'm able to, I'm blessed enough to be able to understand it in a way that I think a lot of people don't, but um, I'm blessed that I actually have a platform that I can kind of explain this to you guys so you do get better. And, you know, next time you play in a regionals or a treasure cup or even at your locals, you can, you know, do better than you, than you normally do. So um, this kind of hurts me because I uh, am teaching this to people at my locals and some of them are probably going to end up beating me like if they, if they keep, if they keep, if I keep coaching him. So, uh, that, 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 that's going to be, that's going to be a, a bittersweet day. I'm, I'm going to be struggling to win winter packs because the five people that, you know, have been, you know, listening to me talk for the past forever are going, are going to beat me. So it's, it's rough, it's rough, but it's also fun at the same time it's great i love you know playing good competition so yeah guys uh like the video if you like the video uh join our discord down below if you um if you want to it's fun um and i'll see you guys on my next video peace